couple thought questions. Is Scripture sufficient for godly living? Is Scripture sufficient for godly living? Are Moses and Christ related? Can you reject Moses and accept Christ? We'll be reading from John chapter 5, beginning with verse 31. We know that in the early part of chapter 5, Jesus had healed a man who'd been paralyzed for 38 years. And then in verses 16 through 19, Jesus talks about the unity of the Father and the Son, the unity of himself with his Father. Jesus shares four FOR statements or because statements following that. In verses 24 and 25, he gave some what I call true statements because he says, I tell you the truth. And then in verses 26 and 27, the reason why those statements in verses 24, 25 were true. And then he challenges the Jews. Now in verses 31 through 47, we find that the testimony of Jesus as Jesus speaks is true. He's saying what I said in verses 16 through 30 are true. And here's the reason why. Let's read together. Verse 31, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is valid. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Now that I accept, not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light. And you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish, and which I am doing, testifies that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard this voice. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form. Nor does his word dwell on you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God? But do you not think I will accuse, but do not think I will accuse you before the Father? Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe, what he wrote. How can you believe what I say? The preceding verses that is coming before verse 31 emphasize that the son can do nothing by himself. This is true even when the son bears witness. The Greek word for valid Maybe it could be translated true. The father testifies, bears witness in this passage for Jesus' sake to establish the content of Jesus' own utterance about himself. I know that his testimony about me is true. Jesus says, If I testified about myself, my testimony is not valid or true. There is another who testifies in my favor. And I know that his testimony about me is true. Remember after Jesus' baptism as he came out up out of the water. Voice from heaven, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. 
testimony concerning Christ. In this passage, verses 31 and 32, this is a piece of which a perfect inwardness awareness of his Father's will that Jesus displays elsewhere. He is the one who speaks what he knows, the one who is able to disclose heavenly things. He knows where he came from and where he is going and stands with the Father who sent him. Jesus knows that he does not speak of his own accord. The Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me. This is precisely what ensures that Jesus is not simply testifying about himself. In this context, the Father's witness is for others only indirectly through Jesus, who speaks and does what the Father wishes. God testifies concerning the Son. In verses 33 through 35, we find that John the Baptist testifies concerning the Son, concerning Christ. You sent to John, referring to John the Baptist, and he testifies to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved, referring to his hearers, the Jews. John was a lamp that burnt, burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. John came to bear witness to the true light, according to chapter 1 and verse 7. He bore witness to the delegation that came to him, sent by the leaders in Jerusalem in chapter 1, 19 through 28 as well as publicly identifying Christ in chapter 1, 29 through 34, as being the Lamb of God, the Spirit-anointed Son of God. In the perfect tense, here, he has testified to the truth, speaks of the fact that this was an established reality at this point in time. Although everything John the Baptist says about Jesus was true, Jesus himself did not, could not accept human testimony. He himself did not depend upon it to establish who he was. Jesus didn't determine who he was by what people said about him. The preceding verses in 19 through 29 emphasize Jesus' intimate knowledge of the Father he is able to say that the Father gives, or he says everything that the Father gives him to say. And the reason for John's testimony is stated in the text. I mention it, that is John's testimony, that you, his hearers, may be saved. Because his hearers were struggling with Christ and his identity. John, the Baptist, had a ministry which was to point to Christ. The Jews accepted John's testimony for a time, but as Christ came to the forefront, they backed off. Christ didn't fit their mold. He was not the Messiah, that is, a king. They were expecting a king, but he came suffering. So John testified for the sake of the Jews. And then in verses 36 through 40, John's testimony was weighty, but not as weighty as the testimony of the Father. He says in verse 36, I have testimony weightier than that of John, the, John referring to John the Baptist. For the very work that the Father has given me to finish and I am doing testifies that the Father has sent me. Jesus healed in John chapter 2. He turned the water to wine in John chapter 2. In John chapter 5, earlier in this chapter, he healed the paralyzed man. And then he says something interesting 
Father has sent me to testify concerning me. The Father and the works that Jesus was doing demonstrate that uh, he was the Christ. Turning the water to wine, miracles, raising Lazarus, and so on, testified that Jesus was doing the Father's work. Then he says, verse 37, And the Father who sent me has testified himself concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor does his word dwell in you. I'm sorry, you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does he word, his word dwell in you, for you do not blame. Long, get my words all tied up. For you do not believe the one he sent. Jesus says, those who were hearing him, you have never heard his voice. Unlike Moses who heard God's voice in Exodus 33 and verse 11. Since Jesus speaks the words of God, it follows that they are, or he is speaking of God. But the Jews did not receive that. They didn't hear the voice of God as Moses did, but they don't hear Moses. And in not hearing Moses, who speaks for God, they did not hear God. He says also, you have never seen his form, and that should be form, F-O-R-M, not for. You have never seen his form, unlike Jacob, who saw God's form in Genesis 32. Since Jesus is the very manifestation of God, and the Jews do not see God in Jesus, it follows that they're not true Israelites. And then he says, nor does his word dwell in you. Unlike Joshua, Joshua 1 and 8, 8 and 9, or the psalmist in Psalm 119 and verse 11, who hid God's word in their hearts, meditating on it, learning not to sin against God, understanding that divine blessing in their lives was vitally dependent on the indwelling of his word. Since Jesus is the very word of God, according to John 1 and verse 1, and the Jews don't have time for him, It follows that they share neither in the experience nor the blessings of Joshua and the psalmist. The Jews did not grasp the importance of the preceding revelation, the revelation that came before through Moses, through the prophets, through John the Baptist. They didn't grasp that. All previous revelation before Christ came was an anticipation of the supreme revelation, Jesus Christ. They missed the previous revelation, so they're missing Christ. Failure to believe in Jesus is therefore compelling evidence that the revelation had not been absorbed understood or obeyed through Moses, through the prophets, through John the Baptist. In the last clause of verse 38, for you do not believe the one he sent, the conjunction for should therefore be taken as introducing the conclusive evidence in support of the indictment. What is the indictment? You have not heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. Then in verses 39 and 40, Jesus is explaining that they don't believe the one who was sent. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me 
to have life. Please understand that the Jewish leaders did not neglect the scripture. They studied diligently, needing no exhortation along those lines. Their motivation, as you study history and understand scripture, is such study was the hope of final acceptance by God. They were looking at a due. They didn't neglect scripture. Their hope was acceptance of God. Their focus was on a do. And Jesus says, in your doing of studying scriptures, you have missed Christ. It seems to some extent the same is true today. We miss Christ and the satisfaction he offers as life because we still think we can do or must do until we are convicted of the spirit of our sin, we think we can do. When convicted of sin, we realize we can't do. We have nothing to offer. We humbly come to Christ. Is it possible we focus so much on Scripture because it is a do? Why do we desire to do? Why did the leaders in that day desire to do? Do appeals to our pride. Look at what I did. We can measure how far along we are with God if we have a list of do's. Well, I read the Bible twice today. I memorized scripture. But he focus on do, Mrs. Christ and the acceptance that we have in him. We don't have to do anything to experience his acceptance. Christ is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. We admit we can't. Christ did. As we correctly present sin and the Holy Spirit convicts, then we can experience life in Christ as we respond to the Spirit's conviction and believe in Christ. I think we struggle in evangelical Christianity today with what we're still trying to do as the religious leaders were in Jesus' day. Rather, we respond to grace in Christ. That is obedience. By contrast, Jesus insists that there is nothing intrinsic, intrinsically life-giving about studying Scripture if one fails to discern their true content, content and purpose. These are the Scriptures, Jesus says, that testify to me. The Jews would study the Mosaic Law, and they would figure out the text but they missed Christ. In the fourth gospel, we find that <clears throat> the Old Testament scriptures are spoken of or mentioned on at least six occasions. What is at stake is a hermeneutical key. By predictive prophecy in the Old Testament, by type, by revelation, they all point to Christ, his ministry, his teaching, his death, his resurrection. But they miss Christ. Jesus makes similar point in numerous passages in the Gospels. Both the law and the prophets prophesy concerning him. Paul discovers that the law was not life-giving in and of itself. 
And he argues that, granted the sinfulness of the human race, no life-giving law was possible. Jesus is the one to whom the Father has granted the right to have life in himself and to impart it to others. As John 1, 4 already stated, Jesus is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes, Romans 10, 4. Like John the Baptist, the scriptures rightly understood point away from themselves to Jesus. If therefore some of the Jews refused to come to Jesus for life, that refusal constituted evidence, evidence that they are not reading their scriptures as they were meant to be read. No independence is more arrogant and more delusive than religious independence, which tragically reaches its point when the central meaning of Scripture is perverted. The Jewish leaders were searching in the Scriptures, made them deaf to Jesus' word. In light of verses 39 and 40, I want to share some thoughts concerning living today. It seems in some circles today we so emphasize the centrality of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, Scripture alone, expository preaching, the point to the point of raising it above Christ. We deny in our words but our practice seems to communicate scripture is higher than God and Christ. And also, I think at times it seems some young people raised in the church, they turn from Christianity because they have not seen Christ, but they've been bombarded with scripture. They have heard scripture but miss seeing Jesus in the life of leaders and parents and of older people. It seems at times, scriptures presented above Christ. We memorize, we read, we listen, but are we displaying eternal life? I may read the Bible, which I think is good. I may memorize scripture but does my life display Christ, who is my life? I can say to kids, my kids, when they were younger, I read my Bible. I memorized scripture. And they say, Dad, but does your life display Christ? Christ is our life. He's the light. He's the vine. He's the living water. He's the shepherd, not scripture. And I'm not belittling scripture in any way, shape, or form. Scripture points to Christ, who is the life. We emphasize expository preaching, reading the Bible, memorizing scripture, which is good. I'm not belittling that whatsoever. But at times, we seem to make Christ secondary. We communicate, we get scripture, we get scripture, and if we get it, we are fine. Do we get Christ correct? Can we share how Christ is our life, our light, our vine, our bread, our living water, our shepherd, and daily living? There can be so much emphasis on Scripture, as the Jews did, that Christ is belittled. We feel better if we read Scripture each day. I encourage reading Scripture daily. But are we reflecting and meditating on Christ, who is the life, the vine, the bread, the shepherd? The shepherd. 
Christ, not merely Scripture? Do our relationships reflect the fruit of the vine, that is Christ, and the Holy Spirit? Sometimes we ask, did you read your Bible today? It's a good question. Should we not also ask, did you experience Christ today? Seminaries teach pastors to handle Scripture well. Good, I'm thankful for that. But what about experiencing Christ? So I spent four years in Bible college, a year in seminary spread out over, over many years, and taught to handle Scripture. Good. But am I, was I experiencing Christ? Scripture is not to be pushed down, belittled. But Scripture points to Christ. Scripture itself does not give life. Our life is Christ. He's the resurrection. He's the good shepherd. He's the vine. So as we read, as we preach, as we study and memorize Scripture, remember they point to Christ. So I don't think Christianity today is saying that Christ is not important. But sometimes because of what we emphasize, we maybe raise Scripture too high and push Christ down. Ponder that. But scripture points to Christ. And then he goes on in verses 41 through 47. Whose praise and glory Jesus accepts. Jesus had no concern for his own praise. I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe if you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain praise that comes from the only God? Jesus' entire commitment was to please his Father, receiving the honor that only the Father can bestow, enjoying the glory of the one and only from the Father. In contrast, His opponents accepted praise from one another. Jesus says, but I know you. No means to perceive, to certain by examination, to conclude. His hearers were men who did not love God. They loved darkness, not the light. Religious. But he says, I know you. How can you believe if you accept praise from men, but make no effort to obtain praise that comes from the only God. The chief punishment of the liar is not so much that he is not believed, but that he does not believe. Similarly, the chief judgment on those who deny that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the Son of God, is not so much that they have no Messiah, but that they follow false messiahs. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. Verse 44 communicates why the Jews accepted teachers who came in their own name, but rejected Christ. How can you believe If you accept praise from one another, yet make no effort to obtain the praise that comes from the only God. Like many people then, now, and between those times, in that day they were heavily dependent upon accepting praise from one another. They made no effort to obtain the praise that comes from God. So inevitably, 
that meant they were open to messianic claimants who used flat flattery or panted after great reputation or whose values were so closely attuned to their audience that the audience felt they were wise, so not open to Messiah. Now, Jesus says some strong things here. I do not accept praise from men, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. He's talking to the religious elite, the religious leaders. But you don't have the love of God in your hearts. I've come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. Religious leaders not accepting Christ. But if someone comes in their own name, you will accept him. Just step aside here for a moment and just some applications in light of the world in which we live. We seem at times so devoted to our own praise. And I'm speaking broadly of Christianity. Thus we encourage our followers to follow men, to follow teachers, music groups, preachers, ministries more than Christ. Our offering of resources places at times greater emphasis on the teacher, the musician, the ministry, or the tool than on Christ. How much time is devoted to promoting ourselves, our products, our solutions, our tools, our church. We advertise ourselves. We seek the praise of others. Thus we miss the praise of God. Consider Christianity, how much time and money is devoted to promoting and advertising. In some respects, evangelical Christianity may be a little beyond where the Jews were. That is moving beyond even seeking praise from men by promoting ourselves. Our books, our CDs, our cruises, our devotional, our seminar, our comforts. Look at what we're doing, our ministry. Look at what our church offers. Pastors are tempted to look to the big guy, the big ministry, the big comforts, the big musician for help. In the process, we diminish Christ. At times, we turn from the core absolutes which flow from Christ, which is the centrality of the family and the centrality of the local church. And we do that with so much beyond family and beyond church. I listen a lot Sometimes I don't talk enough. I understand that. I listen when pastors get together. And there's talk about this leader. There's talk about that great speaker. There's talk about this ministry and what they're doing and trying to take what is being done somewhere else and transport it to their own locality. Isn't that praise? of people. When Jesus speaks throughout the Gospel of John and in this passage, he's saying, it's about me. Jesus concludes chapter 5, but do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. 
If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Jesus says to these Jewish people that Moses, who was highly esteemed by them, who gave the Mosaic Covenant, in Exodus 32, he interceded for the people. They failed to understand the law covenant. They took it as an end in and of itself. The final epitome of right religion, and not as Jesus insisted it is, as a witness of Christ himself. Jesus says, you're not listening to Moses, so you won't believe me, because Moses testified of me. There's a movement that seems fairly strong in some circles today of laying aside the Old Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. But the Old Testament speaks of Christ, whom we turn to. I realize I said some things today about doing I said some things about scripture in contrast to Christ and about praise from people. It's the body of Christ. I think we need to step back and sometimes say it's done in Christ. We respond to that done in obedience and in love. Not to gain, but in response. Scripture points to Christ. We read Scripture, study Scripture, present Scripture. It points to Christ. Keeping the perspective of Christ in relation to Scripture. That it's possible to place Scripture too high. The Jews were doing that. And in the process, missing Christ. And then the whole praise issue, seeking the praise of God. And again, in light of what I presented, if you have comments or questions, feel free to ask me on the way out or sometime in the future. But John holds up Christ. And then he is testified by Moses, the prophets by John the Baptist, by the New Testament writers. And we have what we call completed scripture, which ultimately points to Christ. So we study, we read, we teach, we obey in response to Christ and who he is to live in sensitivity for God's glory. Let's pray together. Father, As we reflect on and read scripture and people are described, we find sometimes down through the ages, some of the same issues come up time and time again. In light of what we discussed, may we be responsive, Father. Obedient, not to obtain, but in response to what we have in Christ. May we glory in your glory. May we glory in Christ's glory. Being faithful to the written revelation, but realizing the written revelation points to the living revelation in Christ. And as we live in Christianity, may we lay aside praise from people and point to Christ, in whose name I pray, amen.